Hello, I'm Kevin Mills. I'm uh, the vo board vice president and the program chair with America Walks, and I'm the vice president of policy with Rails to Trails Conservancy. We're going to do a slideshow today that's about funding walkable environments. And this is going to have two parts to it. One is where do you look for dollars to build a walkable community? And the other is how do you create the political will to prioritize funding for walkability? And the, this prioritization piece has different aspects. How do you elevate projects? How do you make sure there's a, they do a good job administering funds? And how might they create new pots of funds? So first, where is the money that uh, is already out there? And uh, this is not the entire answer, but this is the nation's number one source of funding for walking, um, for walking, biking, and trails is uh, transportation alternatives. Um, this is a, a program that was, got this name in 2012. It was before that, for 20 years before that, called transportation enhancements. This is federal money. It's $850 million a year uh, for all the eligible uses, but about 94% of this money is going to the combination of walking, biking, and trails at this point. But this is money that is administered by states and by regions. And by regions, I mean metropolitan areas, right? Your metropolitan planning organizations are usually regional planning organizations. And some of this money cascades down to them. But one uh, critical thing to keep in mind is that uh, states, state departments of transportation are um, really the nexus of most control of, of transportation funding. So, your state relationships are really important, but there is this federal pot of money that the states administer that's central to our work. So what are the eligibilities for transportation alternatives? It's, it can be spent on new and reconstructed sidewalks, walkways, curb ramps, and bridges. And there are other things, uh, you know, biking, multi-use trails, what have you, that I'm not necessarily spelling out here, um, but just, in terms of building a walkable environment, these are some of the uses you would have your eye on in terms of a justification. I am applying for those funds. Um, so it would also include safe routes for non-drivers. So this would bring in issues like accessibility for persons with disabilities, um, issues facing the, uh, the young and the old, and so on. Rail trails have an explicit category. Safe routes to school is an eligibility within transportation alternatives. Uh, it used to be its own program between um, 2006 and 2012, but after that it became just an eligibility within transportation alternatives. And then there's another program called the Recreational Trails Program. The money is housed within this umbrella called Transportation Alternatives, but it really is its own program with its own rules about revenue and about how it gets administered and spent. And it's often administered by a different state agency than the Transportation Alternatives Program money. So, uh, so often transportation alternatives will be your state DOT and recreational trails will be administered by your um, Department of Natural Resources, say. Um, so for more information about transportation alternative spending, um, you can go to uh, uh, trade.railstotrails.org. Here we have um, the annual spending reports that Rails to Trails generates to keep track of how the states are spending this money and how the regions are spending their share of the money. Um, you can also find um, background information about terminology and just understanding the basics of the program. And then, um, and then if you want further uh, resources beyond that, there are also resources um, on the Federal Highway Administration website. Uh, that's, a, that's US Department of Transportation. So what about some other federal sources? Transportation alternatives is the most important thing to know, but uh, here are some others that you'll want to know about. One is called BUILD, and it's an acronym. You just don't even want to go into what the acronym means. This formerly was called the TIGER program, um, but it's been rebranded by the current administration. These are competitive grants given out by the U.S. Department of Transportation, and there have been a number of uh, walkability projects that have benefited from this program. Um, but uh, often those are, uh, th these are multimodal projects that have a walking or walkability component 
rather than being only about walking. Like if you submitted a proposal just for sidewalks, it might not come out on top. But if you had a broad program that was about enhancing access to transit and included sidewalks, for instance, or a trail to, to a train station, you, you could um, be successful with that. Uh, another program is called Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, or CMAC. And this is for non-attainment areas, although some of the dollars flow to some other um, areas as well in lesser amounts. But anyway, uh, the, the, obviously the justification there being that enhancing the walkability of an area means you know, fewer car trips, less pollution, and that that can be justification for, for commanding some of that money. Then there's a program called the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Clearly we have a terrible issue of uh, serious injuries and fatalities of pedestrians in America today it has been uh, rising for the uh, for quite a while now, for quite some years. Um, at the same time, that overall traffic fatalities have been pretty level, and so the share of fatalities that are um, pedestrians is is growing and is a big concern. However, historically, this program only a very very tiny share of it has gone to improve the safety of walking and biking. That should change but uh, recognize that there may not be a well-worn path there for you to, um, to get those dollars, but we should be demanding more of those dollars to address these rising fatalities and injuries of pedestrians. And then finally, I flagged the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. Uh, the, these are the most flexible dollars. There's a lot of dollars there. These are the most flexible dollars that a state DOT has at its disposal. And so they, they love these funds and they can use them for whatever they prioritize. They rarely prioritize walking or walkability enough to spend these dollars on it. But uh, again, with um, strong advocacy, perhaps we can begin to change that. Also wanna bring to your attention state and local funding. Um, one thing is that if you do get a federal grant of dollars, let's say from transportation alternatives, there's a matching requirement only 80% of the dollars at most can come from that federal grant and at least the 20% need to come from state or local or private sources. And so you're, uh, you wanna be thinking about how do you come up with the match to secure uh, and spend those uh, federal dollar grants you might get. But the other thing would be supplementing federal dollars. That is um, increasingly states and localities, especially states have been stepping up to add transportation funding of their own to the overall pot and not just thinking about how to make matches. And this is in part because the federal government hasn't raised the gas tax since 1993. And so the buying power of federal transportation funds has been receding by inflation. And, uh, and so many more states are saying, well, we have a big problem with road maintenance and bridge maintenance and other things that we're trying to do in the transportation space. And therefore we need to figure out a way to uh, inject some additional state funding. And, uh, and as that happens, there's been an opportunity for those of us who are walkability advocates to, to step in and say, okay, state, you really want this to be multimodal. You wanna make sure you're helping um, to create safer walking places to walk and more uh, convenient and accessible places to walk as part of that overall uh, greater investment in transportation by the state. Another thing to keep in mind, if you are advocating for more state funding or local funding of transportation is that it, uh, of walking, uh, walkability I should say, is that it won't always be in the context of transportation policy. That has certainly been the bread and butter of walkability funding, transportation funding, but in some states and some localities, you can see environmental uh, policy dollars flow to walkability. You might see recreation dollars flow there, economic development dollars, and sometimes public health dollars. And so it just depends on where you live, whether you have opportunities in some of these other policy spaces. So uh, you hear at the bottom of the slide, I have some other source of information is the Active Transportation Policy Hub that we run here out of Rails to Trails, but there certainly are other resources out there on the internet that you could, uh, could look up as well. Um, you'll find some resources from America Walks, you'll see some resources from 
some of our state and local advocacy friends, uh, as well as agencies. Um, and, uh, and then maybe uh, something like the National Conference of State Legislators, if you're looking at, uh, at legislation. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part of our uh, conversation today is about creating the political will to prioritize funding walkability. And this is really important in the sense that you want uh, to make sure that uh, the to-do lists for um, state and local governments include making these places uh, more walkable, making them safer. And, uh, and you wanna uh, know that the money that is available is being spent well uh, and that, uh, that money that can flow to walking is flowing to walking. And then you also, as we just discussed, want to see um, opportunities to create uh, larger pots of funding to support walkability. So how do, how do we start to make all those things happen? And the first thing is uh, to have, you want to meet your inside champs. Uh, and basically the underlying lesson here is relationships are everything in politics. Uh, and so uh, you, you definitely want to get to know people who can help you. And, uh, and here uh, I started with examples of uh, the state bicycle and pedestrian coordinators, which are, who are usually in the state department of transportation, as well as the uh, MPO, that's an acronym for Metropolitan Planning Organization. So these are the regional planning organizations, often a council of governments hosts them. And, uh, and there they do um, many of the plans that will essentially establish whether uh, you have that opportunity to move uh, walkability projects forward, right? So, uh, so you will also wanna get, there'll be other people you wanna get to know at the state level, who's if you're interested in a multi-use recreational trail, you know, maybe those recreational trails program funds are being administered out of the Department of Natural Resources or the Parks Department. And so you're going to want to figure out who, you know, who controls those per strings as well, the implementation of those things. So, so anyway, the point is build those relationships with the people who, uh, who really uh, are, it's their job to move these things forward and they want to work with you, they want to help you. And then one of the things you'll want to be talking to them about is how you get in the plans. And I put plural here on purpose, right? There are, um, depending on where you live, you will want to be asking a lot of questions about what are the mix of plans that uh, your particular area is relying on? And what are the timetables for updating those plans? Where are they in their cycle? Um, so the Metropolitan Planning Organization, as I said, is uh, the keeper of many key plans. One is that they are, are usually the source for the Transportation Improvement Program, which is a list of projects going out at least four years that's required by federal law in order to drive the transportation program, right? So, so that's one key thing to have your, your eye on is, um, are your project ideas being put in the transportation plan that can drive the, uh, the funding of those projects? Um, many areas also have, um, trail plans, they may have pedestrian and bicycle plans. And so you want to find out that mix of, of plans you have and what opportunities you have to influence what goes in those plans going forward. Um, broader umbrella over um, much of that planning can be a comprehensible, oh, sorry, comprehensive regional plan, which may have sub chapters about things like transportation and parks that could be relevant to what you're trying to, uh, to achieve. But but this umbrella is really about the long-term community development goals um, of a place. So another thought about creating political will is we wanna cultivate elected officials, um, especially that they can help you with uh, implementation of projects in terms of con constituent service and building political will. They also are relevant if you wanna create, legislate new, new pots of money, of course. Um, and you wanna be getting in the loop and thinking about sources of information that could help you from the federal, state, and local standpoints, right? Lo you know, as if you're a local advocate, getting plugged into what's happening in your community, uh, you know, uh, if you're not already, you know, obviously is central, but it is also really helpful to um, ferret out those good sources of state uh, information about what's happening in your state as that could affect your local, and then federal sources like America Walks and Rails to Trails who can help you with the bigger picture of what's happening in the country. 
you want to know who your allies are and you want to be collaborating with them. Uh, if you are, you know, if you're going into the woods and it's bear country, they'll tell you to make yourself look big, right? And uh, it's the same thing in, uh, in creating political will. You want to um, show that you have a lot of different kinds of people and a lot of people behind what you're saying. And you want to always show up. Persistence is uh, really underrated in politics. Um, if you show up a lot um, and keep, uh, you know, keep on message and keep pushing the same things, um, you, you can start to break through. Final slide I have for you here today is about making the case. And persuasion is important, facts are important, but they're certainly not alone sufficient, which is why I led with relationships and some of those issues, because you can't just say, I've got a good argument, and that alone will carry the day. But uh, so some of making the case um, that you do want to do, though, is you want to be able to document needs. This will show that uh, investing in walkability will have a lot of value for the community. And it also relates to political demand. People want this and politicians relate to constituent demand, right? So, um, so the picture I have here is of the District of Columbia's pedestrian master plan. And they did a really clever sidewalk gap analysis where they really show where are there sidewalks and where aren't there sidewalks. And that can be a really good way to crystallize what it is that we still need to accomplish, but what it is that we've already invested in that we can uh, build that on. What's the baseline we can build it on? And so it really then becomes about making very high value investments in the connectivity of the sidewalk network. And so that's just a good example of documenting needs. You want to be able to tout benefits. Um, and among the many benefits, it, it, it uh, parallels those policy areas I mentioned before, right? There's transportation, mobility, right? There's access, there's health, there's environment, recreation, all these things. But one that you should definitely not um, forget about, that you should put emphasis on, is safety. Because with the high number of fatalities and serious injuries, it's a serious and growing issue for our society and uh, is really should be a central part of, of making your case as a, as a walkability advocate. And then the last thought here is that you wanna be telling stories. You wanna be putting a face on, uh, on the problem. And that can relate to the safety issue. If people have been getting hurt, you want to, uh, you know, you want to you, you use their names, use their stories to the extent that that's appropriate and tasteful. Um, it, ju just because it, uh, it brings emotion, right? Heart, uh, head matters, but so does heart. And, uh, and knowing that, um, that real people have been affected by poor design in your community can really help um, you know, bring to life the, the case for, uh, for doing more for safety. So anyway, those are the thoughts. Thank you for, for joining me and, uh, and uh, thank you for being a Walking College Fellow.